If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 9. If you need a Bible, raise up your hand and we'll put a Bible in your hand. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to keep that. If you know someone who needs a Bible, take that. It's our gift to you to give to someone else that they would read and study God's word with us. This morning, though, our text is going to be Revelation chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 21 as we take this journey in the book of Revelation. We're continuing our time. So let's read the text, and then we'll come back and expound it. It says there in Revelation 9, starting in verse 13, as John writes, he says, The six angels sounded, And I heard a voice from the four horns of the altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound there at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year, they were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And I heard a number of them. And thus I saw the horse, the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red and hassan blue and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions and their mouths came out fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, they did not repent of their works of their hands. And they should not, uh, they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and, and wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. Man, heavy duty stuff. We are in the book of Revelation, this apocalyptic book, this prophetic book. But remember the nature behind it. It is the revelation of who? Jesus. It's a book of hope for the believer, for you and I, because we are called to look to Jesus for our hope. And remember, this letter, this epistle was written to the churches, seven churches, to encourage them that Christ is going to fulfill his word and Christ is going to come back. Here, though, in Revelation chapter 9, this future event known as the great tribulational period. This happens at the tail end of those seven years. And remember the culmination. At the end of it all, at the end of this tribulational time, at the end of the great tribulational period will come what the Bible calls, what the scripture says is the great day of the Lord. We also call that the second coming of Christ. Now, a couple weeks back, we looked at the fifth trumpet judgment. And it was a doozy. It's hard to read. It's hard to grasp these judgments that are going to come upon the earth. We know that there are seven trumpet judgments. The first was judgment upon the land. The second was judgment upon the seas. The third was judgment upon the fresh waters. And the fourth trumpet judgment was that of the heavens. And we know that as these judgments fall befall upon the earth, that they will come through a variety of means. There will be worldwide earthquakes, volcanic activity. A third of, of the ecology of the earth will be wiped out. The waters poison, the skies blackened, weather and patterns radically changed. It's going ha- to happen in such a way that will blow man's minds away. But here's what's interesting. We think, could it get, ever get worse? Can it get even worse than what we've read so far? Look at Revelation 8, 13, because John says it will. There in verse 13, John says, And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe and woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. We get to Revelation 8, 13, and we get these three woes. In other words, as horrible as the judgments have been so far, there are still three to come, and they are going to be even worse. 
Now, here's what we found a couple weeks ago as we, were in Reve- as we jumped into Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 is actually a transition. You say, well, what's the transition? We see that the first four trumpet judgments have come from heaven. They've come from heavenly angels. But in Revelation chapter 9, those first 12 verses that we looked at, what we see here is that the fifth and the sixth trumpet judgment literally will be hell on earth. It is hell that's unleashed. In fact, that's the title of the message that we gave a couple weeks ago, hell on earth. And there in verses 1 through 12, what did we see? But Satan received the key to the bottomless pit. And that pit opens and unleashes these chained demons. Now, if you missed that study, let me encourage you to go back and you can either listen to it or watch it because it's a fascinating study. We focused on the origin of Satan. We focused on the fall of Satan. We focused on the position of Satan, who he is. And there we see him unleashing this bottomless pit where these chained demons are unleashed for this time of judgment. And what does John see? John sees smoke rising out of this pit like a great furnace. He sees massive amounts of locusts and he sees them as these deadly scorpions with tails to be able to sting. And power was given to these demons these demonic beings. Remember, the judgment that came upon them, they were not to touch the land. They were not to kill anyone, but rather their job was solely to inflict torment and judgment. We know that they couldn't touch God's 144,000. They are sealed and protected by God. And here's what we read, is that it was so bad that people wanted to die, and yet they weren't allowed to. They could not die. Death was removed. And there we read in verse 10 of chapter 9 that this plague, this judgment will last for some five months. It's interesting you study this section. It's amazing. At the same time, it's terrifying. People wanting to die and not being allowed to see and find death. But this morning, we're here in this section, the sixth trumpet, there verse 13 through 21 And literally what we see once again is not just hell unleashed on earth, but what we have here are demonic forces unleashed on earth. This time of great tribulation, this last half, this fifth trumpet, this this first woe we see, and now we come to the second woe, the sixth trumpet there in verse 13 and 14. Look with me again in verse 13. It says, And the sixth angel sounded, And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound there at the great river Euphrates. Who is it that's sounding these trumpets? Remember, we studied this back in the beginning of Revelation chapter 8. But there are several angels, very unique angels, holy angels that serve the Lord, that stand before God. These are known as presence angels because they have a unique position, they have a unique authority. And we believe that we're able to identify at least one of the seven. And we believe that to be the Gabriel, uh, Gabriel, uh, the angel Gabriel. And we look at that and we know that because of Luke 1.19. You might recall the account when Gabriel went to Zacharias and said, hey, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son and his name is going to be John. And, and, and Zacharias asked him, well, how do I know that, you know, who you are? And he says, well, I'm Gabriel, the one who stands before God, a standing angel. And we see that this angel here in verse 13 sounds his trumpet and we see that the next woe from the Lord is unleashed. And it's interesting because there in verse 13, we see that that he hears a voice coming from where? We hear a voice, it says, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now, who is this voice? Well, in order to understand who this voice is, we got to realize where the voice is coming from. It says that, that it's coming from the golden altar. This altar that is before God. 
the golden altar before the Lord. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen this. We've seen this altar before here in Revelation chapter 6. They're 9 through 11. We see it again in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And this altar represents the place of prayer. This is where the incense was burned. And remember, the incense is, is a sign or a symbol of the, the prayers of the saints rising up before the Lord. I find it interesting because this altar, was, which was at one point in time a place where prayers of mercy were petitioned before God, where God's help and, and petition was brought before the Lord. But now we see in verse 13 that it's from this golden altar that judgment is brought. And so here we have a voice that comes out of this altar. Many believe this voice to be the Lord, to be Jesus, the Lamb of God, pronouncing this judgment. And here's what I find interesting, is that the voice that comes out of this altar commands the sixth angel to do something. We read there in verse 14 that he commanded the the sixth angel who had the trumpet to release four more angels who are bound there at the river Euphrates. And so this voice that's coming from heaven, from the golden altar, tells this this, uh, sixth angel to release four angels. So the question is this, who are these four angels that are bound? Who are they? And why why are they being released and what is their job and what is their role? I think it's important for us to, to notice there that these angels, though they are called angels, they are not angels of God. Holy angels or those that serve the Lord are never bound. But these are bound. In fact, these are demons that need to be restrained. Now, we looked at this the last time we were in Revelation chapter 9. Again, we looked at demons that are chained, that are bound for a time, for a pointed time. We looked at that Revelation 9 verses 1 and 2. And so these demonic beings there in verse 14 are chained for this appointed time. And now is the appointed time where they are to be released. And here's what's unique about these demons is that these four specific demons mentioned in verse 14 seem to be leaders or controllers of a massive demonic army. That's what we look at in this section. That's what we find. And it's interesting where their origin is. It says there in verse 14, and to the sixth angel and to the, uh, who had the seventh trumpet, he said, release the four angels who are bound at what location? We read at the great river Euphrates. Another interesting point there that you can mark in your Bible. That John describes these demons as being bound by this location there, the great river Euphrates. And there's significance to that, believe it or not. Why so specific and why this location? Well, this was known as one of the four rivers that was originally there at the very beginning of all things. There in the Garden of Eden, all the way back in Genesis. Its history is associated with sin and death and attack on God. This is the place where Satan's deception uh, was brought to Adam and, and Eve. This was the place that Satan's assault began with God and began with mankind there at the great river Euphrates. It's interesting because it is also here that we read and study in Genesis where great deception began there at the Tower of Babel. It's here at the great river Euphrates where world empires were formed to attack God's people. Think of the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. And many would associate this area, this region, as being a place where demons would work and move to stop and work against the plans and the purpose of God. Now these demons that we read here that are being unleashed, they actually have great, tremendous power. And what power do they have? But we read in verse 15 and 16, they have the power of death. Look with me. It says in verse 15, so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year, they were released to kill a third of mankind. Verse 16. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And I heard the number of them. Now what makes these demons unique and powerful is specifically that they have the power to kill. 
Remember, prior to this, with the fifth trumpet judgment, death was taken away. Look at Revelation 9, 6. It says, and in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee them. And how long would that last? When we jump in verse 10 of chapter 9, it says, for five months, that judgment will be unleashed on earth. But now, now these demons have the power to kill and destroy. Do you know that that's always Satan's modus operandi? That it's Satan's goal to always steal, kill, and destroy. In fact, John 10.10, 10, we'll put it on the screen if we're able. It says the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is always the plan of the enemy. It's to stop the work of God. To stop mankind to ruin and destroy God's work. You remember the father who had the son that was demon-possessed. Peter, James, and John go with Jesus up onto the Mount of Transfiguration while the rest of the disciples were down the mountain. And a father who had a son that was demon-possessed brought them to the disciples hoping that they might be able to cast him out. They couldn't. Jesus finally shows up on the scene and Jesus and and this father are having this dialogue back and forth and the father tells Jesus that the demons often will throw him into the water or throw him into the fire to destroy him. That's always the enemy's MO. Do you know it's the same with you this morning? The enemy wants to destroy and ruin your life. He wants to destroy your relationship with God the Father. He wants to stop all forward progress with your walks with the Lord. It's so important that we are not naive of the spiritual realm and of our enemy because the enemy wants to stop all forward progress in your walk with the Lord. Now, I find it interesting because here we see that these demonic entities have a specific purpose. We read there in verse 15, it says, so the four angels, these four angels, who had been prepared, it says, for the hour, for the day, for the month, and for the year. What's that mean? Well, I think it's pretty obvious is this. God designed this to happen when he designed it to happen. These demonic beings were chained. They were trapped. They were stuck. Just like those we read in in chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 with the bottomless pit, these demonic entities were chained for such a day as this. Remember, after the resurrection, that the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, when are you going to restore your kingdom? Well, Jesus said something very specific there in Acts 1, 6, and 7. Jesus, they asked Jesus and said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the season, not for you to know exactly when, And yet here we see that this is revealed, that now is the time that God is going to release these demonic beings to fulfill his plan. Remember the source of all this, guys, where all this originates. As John has this vision of revelation of what we're studying and reading this morning, there in chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Revelation, John is translated or raptured there up in heaven. He sees God on the throne. And there God the Father is holding a scroll with seven seals. What is that scroll? It's God's final plan. It's God's final judgment and will and wrath. His final plan of redemption and salvation for all mankind. And it's there that each one of those seals are being revealed. And this, once again, is God's judgment upon a disbelieving world. Now, it's interesting because these demonic beings, again, have tremendous power. You read in verse 15 that they were released to kill a third of mankind. That's a lot. Back in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, when we studied the four seals broken, one-fourth of the world dies there. Here, another one-third is wiped out. Now, uh, my wife can tell you, I'm not good at math. Math is not my strong suit whatsoever, but I know if you take one-fourth and one-third, you'll get over half, okay? I know that much for sure. Here's what, that, what this means, is at this point in time, in Revelation 9, there, verse 15, at this junction in the Great Tribulation, over half of the world's population will be wiped out from God's judgment, from the wars, 
from the persecution, from the demonic judgments, this tribulational period. Imagine what that will do to the world. Imagine how the world will cope with that amount of bodies that pass. A third of the world wiped out. And how could such devastation take place? How could this actually happen? Well, we read there in verse 16, it says, Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And I heard the number of them. That shows you the amount of this, this demonic force that's being unleashed to bring God's judgment on the world. Now, oftentimes we come across sections like this and there's debate. Remember, one of the things that we know about the book of Revelation, there's a variety of those that have different views and opinions. And we looked at the, the different positions of Revelations. We studied this earlier. And some will look at Revelation chapter 9, this section 13 through 21, and they'll say, well, they believe that this isn't a demonic force, but rather a human army, like China's multi-million man army. And that these here, these horses that are mentioned here aren't really horses, but rather they're tanks and other weapons of war that are used. And, and they'll say, well, this, you know, they'll say this army is from the north. It's described in Ezekiel chapter 28 and, and 39. And, and that might be the case, but I, I just don't see that lining up with what we read in chapter 9 in those first chap section that we read along with this as well. It seems best that this is uh, interpreted and viewed as literal demonic entities that is being used for this judgment. Now look how this demonic force is described. We look at verse 17. And there in verse 17, it says, And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hessen blue, sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By fire, and the smoke, and the brimstone, which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails. And their tails are like serpents, having heads with them. And they do harm. Once again, John's doing his very best as he's seeing this vision unfold to write down and document as best as he can describe these demonic forces. And notice how he describes them. He describes them as being fiery red. He describes them as being a hassan blue. He describes them as being like sulfur yellow. You know what this is a description of? It's a description of hell, of hellfire and brimstone. You know, you ever burn a flame or you ever burn a fire where you can see all the different colors. It's, it's red and it's yellow and you can look at the center and it's blue and you get all the different layers and different depths of heat. And that's what's being described here. And it says here that out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. And this is how they are going to wipe a third uh, of the world out. It's with this. Notice, turn with me to Revelation chapter 14, a couple chapters to your right. Look at verse 10. In verse 11, or verse 10, I should say, verse 9, actually. Revelation 14, starting in verse 9, it says, Then a third of the angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with what? Fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This rhetoric is, is not just associated with this section, but we see this in other places in Scripture. So again, you know, this is really ominous. This is really terrifying. It's really scary. This sixth uh, trumpet judgment as these four angels are unleashed and they seem to be some type of leaders that lead this massive army of 200 million demonic beings to bring judgment on the earth. We have the release of demons and we have the return of death. 
But now what do we see? But we see the reason why. It's because of the act of defiance. You know, we look at this and it's so horrific. And we think, oh man, why would God do that? Sometimes we can think that we are more gracious or loving or patient than God himself. Now pause for a moment and remember this. In the midst of this great tribulation, in the midst of this tribulation period, listen, it is still God's heart to reach mankind. We read in Peter where Peter tells us that God wishes that none would perish, but that all would come to what? Repentance. And even during the tribulation, God will always have a remnant on earth of those that believe, those that get saved after after the rapture, those that will share the gospel. We have the 144,000. We have Gentile believers. We have the two witnesses. We have the angel that will be flying around proclaiming the gospel. The gospel will still be shared. Why? Because it's God's heart for mankind to be saved. But why the wrath? Why the judgment? Well, look at verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, notice, They did not repent. They did not repent of their works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thievery. You stop and think, you know, how much more does one have to see on earth for them to turn to God? How much more supernatural judgment does, do people need to see at this junction in time for them to say, God, save me, forgive me? Well, apparently, it's still not enough for those that are here on earth. You see, by this time, they know, the world will know at this junction that everything that is happening is a supernatural work of God. This is God's judgment. They've seen the Antichrist at this point in time. They've heard the gospel at this time. They have options to reject the mark of the beast at this time. They would have heard and seen the two witnesses sharing the gospel. Half of the world's population decimated. And still, what do we see? There are those here who are unwilling to repent and turn to Jesus. Why? Well, as you just read, as we just looked at verse 20 and 21, it's scary, but because it is the hardness of their hearts that they will not turn to the Lord. The hardness of man's heart. You know, this gives us a warning this morning for you and I to not be those that will harden our hearts to the Holy Spirit. Hold your spot there in Revelation uh, 9. Turn to your left, just a couple books to your left, to the book of Hebrews. A few pages there to your left. I want you to turn there because I want you to see this in Hebrews chapter 3. Look what the author of Hebrews says to us. It's a word of warning from hardening our hearts to the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 12, Look at the exhortation we're given. It says in verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Remember, the book of Hebrews was written to Christians, to believers, those within the body of Christ. And the exhortation that the author of Hebrews gives is, guys, don't harden your hearts. So here's the question. How does someone grow in a hard heart? How does someone build a a, a stiffness and a resistance? I'll tell you how. It's by continuing and daily and regularly rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit. It's rejecting the word of God, the promises of God, the truth of God. 
It's when God speaks into your life and you say, no, no, no. And every time we do that, there is a hardening of our heart to the work of the Holy Spirit. Christians can fall into that trap. How do we know that? Because we're exhorted in Hebrews not to be those who harden their heart into what? Unbelief. Now, this makes sense for those in the world because they're not saved. But even they, the Holy Spirit was working in their life, and now they're resisting, and they're resisting, and they're resisting, and they're resisting. It's a word of warning. We notice there, back in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 and 21, that we're told twice, two different times, that they chose to not repent. They did not repent. They did not repent. And why is it mentioned twice? Because the issue with mankind has always been this one issue, the issue of repentance. And what is repentance? Guys, listen, repentance is simple. Repentance is simply having a change of mind, a change of heart. And what is that that we must repent from but sin and disobedience? The rejecting of the truth of God's word. Now notice here in Revelation 9, verse 20 and 21, the sins that led to this. Look again, verse 20, it says, And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities. Here, John gives us a list of specific things that they succumbed to, that they gave themselves over to. The first on their list is idolatry. What's idolatry but false gods? That's what that is. It's just false gods. Idols. Works of of made with human hands. That's what that is. And we know that idols can be anything. It can be money. It can be riches, power, it can be position, it could be uh, literally a false god, a false deity. But here what we find at this junction in time, this tribulation, they were unwilling to give up other false gods. But then he also says here on the list, there are murders. And we know, based on our study in Revelation, that many Christians at this point in time will be put to death for their faith in Christ. You know, it's interesting, you look at the political climate of our country, you look at the social climate of our country, you look at the uh, political climate of other countries, those that are postmodern, that once had a biblical foundation, and now what we find is there is a hardening of uh, of hearts towards God and God's word, and specifically Christianity. They're tolerant of many religions, but when you mention Christ, it's even more so. Why? Because listen, we're headed that direction where mankind here in this tribulation will be anti-Christ, completely against anything that has to do with Jesus himself. They're going to get rid of Christians. Notice, uh, turn with me uh, to 2 Timothy. Look what this will look like. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul, as he writes to Timothy, describes for us what this will look like in the end. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Paul says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters and proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. In the last times. Let me tell you, does that not describe our time today? That's the days that we're living in today. And so when we look at this in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 and 21, this list of things, how they harden their heart, this is another one. Then we have another list, sorceries. It's very interesting, that word sorceries um, in the Greek is the word pharmakia, uh, which means to practice magic. It means to practice witchcraft. Literally, it's where we get the word pharmacy, our English word pharmacy. And many believe specifically this has to do um, with taking drugs. 
This idea of losing yourself. Do you know it's interesting when you study world religions, false religions, cultic religions, that many of them have the practice that in order for you to worship and experience their deity and the worship that you need to take some type of hallucinogenic, you need to take some drug in order to get in the state where you can speak with your deity, your God, the demonic entities. You know, we're living in a day-to-day that is fueled by drug use, aren't we? Where they're taking those that are at one point in time illegal and now they're saying it's legal. It's okay. You know, it started with weed and now it's going to other things, mushrooms and other things. And you know, it's only a matter of time before they're just going to allow anything and everything, whatever you want to do, just take. Sexual morality is on the list. All sexual sins simply allowed. We see that today. At one point in time, what was deemed wrong and sin is now considered good and right. Theft and thievery, taking what doesn't belong to them, taking what belongs to others. And here's what we find. They harden their hearts against God. Why? Because they love the darkness rather than the light. They love their sin rather than wanting to be saved. And as a result, they harden themselves to Jesus. We see this in the world today, but what we find then is going to be even worse. Because quite literally, at this junction in time of this great tribulational period, there's going to be the opportunity for them to follow the Antichrist. And one of the ways that they're going to do that is by receiving what? The mark of the beast. We're going to study this later on in Revelation. We're going to see this uh, in chapter 13. We're going to see it in chapter 14. As we look at this, the Antichrist is going to rise up. We're going to study about who the Antichrist is and what he does. But that mark of the beast is going to be a pledge of loyalty and a pledge of worship. You know, we talked about this earlier, how, you know, there's all these microchips nowadays that they can be implanted. And and like our dog has a chip implanted in her hip. So she gets lost. They can scan her. And oh, she lives with Pastor Louie. That's her house. And so she can be returned. And, And I think it's fascinating. I love technology. And so people freak out, that's the mark of the beast. Listen, that's not the mark of the beast. That's just an electronic chip. Now, it might be something like that, but we need to remember and understand that the mark of the beast is a sign and a pledge of loyalty and worship. That's what, we'll, that's what that will be. And so we look at this section, guys, the sixth trumpet. I told you it was going to get heavy. I told you it was going to be hard for us to study and look at. And this is a very hard section to read. How do we apply this to us? Well, the application is is this. We need to be warned ourselves not to grow hard to the things of God. We need to be warned for for us as we read this, as, as we study this, just like these people here, these individuals that harden themselves to the Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't be those that follow that example. But rather, we'd be sensitive to the move of the Holy Spirit that as we read his word, we would choose to walk in obedience to it. Each of us are in different stages and places with our walk with God. God is working things in and out of us. And it's from here that we must heed his voice and obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. So if God has been working on you and speaking to you and challenging you, asking you to remove things and to add things in your life, are you listening? Are you responding? Are you walking in obedience to the Lord? Has the Lord been prompting you to share the gospel with your neighbor, with your coworker, with the the, the people around you, your family, and yet you've been resisting? Don't harden your heart to the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Heed his voice. Walk in obedience. And it's my prayer that us as a church, when we come across a section like this, as terrifying as that will be, remember where you and I are. At this point in time, we are with the Lord. We are in his presence. We've been raptured up. Amen. But you know what? As we read this, may it stir us up to share the gospel, to share the good news while we have the time, redeeming the time because the days in which we are in today are evil. Help us, Lord, to take heed. Help us to walk in obedience. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for our time in the word. 
God, we know it's a frightful.